exciting Uptown Planners monthly meeting. I'm Sohel Makshab, the board chair. I will be your host this evening for our wonderful agenda we have. Um, I'd like to allow the uh, board members to introduce themselves before we get this show started. So feel free one at a time. Hi, Gail Freed. Hi, this Hi, is Bill, Bill Smith. Elliott. Bill Smith, University of Heights. <clears throat> Bill Alec, University Heights. Dennis Sason, Hillcrest. My video is not working. Bob Daniel, Mission Hills. Stephen Klein, Mission Hills. Michael Brown, Mission Hills. Roy Dahl, Hillcrest. Matt Medeiros. Bill Crest. All right. Is that everybody? You missing anybody? No? All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, let's begin with the adoption of the agenda. Any comments? No? All right. Great. Uh, meeting minutes. Do we have any comments on meeting minutes? No comments on meeting minutes. All right. Can I get an approval on which months are we approving right now? So, so Heal, I wasn't sure about that. So, the, the, let's see, the December ones were up, and um, I think the other, they're still in draft. So, okay. So remember, did we approve the, the November minutes? I don't recall. Maybe September. Sorry. So, so uh, to date, we have up to December minutes posted on our site for people to view. Correct? Is that what you're saying? Uh, hold on one minute. Let me look at this real quick. I believe everything. I have November and December as draft. November, December as draft. On the website. I okay. Thought, did we approve uh, November? I thought we approved them both at the last meeting. Okay. Got the uh, January or the, yeah January meeting. Okay, so we haven't posted our January. Uh, or do we? Wait, what am I talking about? Did we even meet in January? We didn't. <laughs> oh, so the I'm December sorry. meeting that we haven't approved yet. That's Whatever the, the last meeting was, we have not yeah, yet. We need to do December minutes. Okay, so let's, I think we'll just wait till next month to approve December meeting. Publicly, we're announcing we're approved up to date on our minutes to November. Uh, December has not been approved yet. If you have any comments, please let us know. We will revisit the approval of those minutes at our next meeting. Um, speaking of meeting minutes, um, our wonderful note taker, has resigned from the board. So who will be taking the place of uh, Zach when it comes to uh, meeting minutes? Do we have any volunteers? You know, uh, Sohel, uh, is he the secretary? Yes, sir. So I think, I think the more important issue is, uh, do we elect a new secretary? Okay, well said. Um, I don't have that as an action item on this. I mean, we can probably just discuss it, um, uh, possibly make it an action item for next month as far as uh, designating someone as the new secretary. Yeah, I don't, by the way, I don't know if that is, needs to be a noticed item because it's an internal board member. Uh, okay, I just, I, I want to follow the rules. I want to make sure we're not breaking any uh, rules with, with how we go about this. So. Um, if anybody knows, if Michael Prince knows, someone please weigh in. Otherwise, if it is as easy as just appointing someone from this executive board, let's proceed with that. Otherwise, we can wait and go through whatever formal process we have to go through. So, so Hill, I, I'm happy to take the notes tonight. I'd prefer to do it through a more formal process, though. Um, but I'm happy to take notes tonight um, in Zach's absence. Okay. All right. Um, and we'll wait to see what the actual process is. Michael, do you by any chance know what the process is for appointing 
General Secretary, is that something that we have to put as a public notice or can we just do that internally? It's typically um, a noticed action item because the officers, you know, given the elections and a normal process, the, the officers is uh, um, election or the appointment of officers is done by the board in a public setting. Um, understanding Tom's point, you probably could take the action tonight, provided that you add two thirds, you know, vote and all of the approvals. But um, given sort of Quint's uh, um, sort of volunteering of the minutes, it, it may make sense to just sort of put that as a, an action item for a future meeting. Okay, so how about this? Uh, let's ponder until next meeting, as far as somebody on this board who's interested in the position of secretary. Um, and then uh, maybe contact me ahead of time before next month's meeting and I will put a public notice as to who is interested and then we'll take action on it on, in our March meeting. Uh, for this evening, uh, Clint, uh, we appreciate you taking the notes. Um, uh, do we have any CPC updates? Clint or Tom, either one of you, go ahead. Sure. So. Um... I went to the CPC meeting on uh, the last Tuesday, the 26th. Um, there were uh, several items on the agenda, a couple of which we will be discussing tonight. Um, the only one that had a, um, an action item on it was the Parks for All plan, which we'll be uh, discussing tonight. Um, I did vote in that, um, in that discussion and I voted uh, no on the motion and the motion was three parts there was a motion or the three parts of the motion were to uh, maintain uh, funding in the facilities plans of the north cities there was a uh, a part of the motion to uh, recommend that we um, that the parks for all plan uh, be endorsed by the cpc and then there was a uh, component of it to send the uh, parks plan back to the CPGs. Um, I voted no primarily for the first two reasons. Um, one was that the, the plan, uh, the city's plan is to promote equity and to distribute funds across the city and by maintaining funds in our uh, park rich areas already. Uh, that sort of goes counter to that, to that notion. And the second reason I voted no is because um, I couldn't vote yes to endorse the plan without it having been here um, to the to this committee. So um, that was the action item. There was a discussion on the CPG elections, which we'll be talking about tonight, but there was no uh, action on that. And then a discussion of the uh, franchise fee or the franchise agreements with SDG and E. And again, there was no uh, no vote on that. So uh, absent that, that was the update on the CPC. Great. I appreciate the detailed update and uh, we'll learn more about uh, the subject matter in tonight's meeting. Um, all right. Do we have any representatives of elected officials with us this evening? Hello. <laughs> this is uh, my very first meeting. So I know uh, I see a few familiar faces, but hi, everyone. My name is David Vance. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am a community representative with the office of Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs. It is my second day on the job today. So I am, I've literally just started, um, but I am uh, very much looking forward to seeing you all in these meetings in the future and working with uh, Congresswoman Jacobs's team to serve the people of the 53rd district. Um, I do have a couple brief updates to share if y'all are interested. If we, no, I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, happy to share briefly. Um, the Congresswoman was in the district last week um, for district work week. And while she was here, she was able to do a small business tour to meet with some local small business owners to talk with them about what they're doing to try to stay afloat and trying to continue to succeed during the pandemic and what she can do on Capitol Hill to continue to help them. And uh, while she was here, um, or I should say not while she was here, but yesterday actually, she also introduced her first bill, which was uh, co-sponsored co by another representative in Georgia. And it was a censure resolution against representative Marjorie Taylor Greene and representative Jacobs has also called for her resignation. And that's largely in response to her longstanding, well-documented history of inflammatory rhetoric, which includes uh, supporting conspiracy theories, racist remarks, 
calls for violence against other elected officials. Uh, so the Congresswoman did introduce that censure resolution in the House yesterday. And um, other than that, um, we just wanted to say, keep doing what you can to continue to support small businesses. Um, I myself order a lot of Postmates <laughs> from some of the small local businesses around here, and I try to do that as much as possible. Um, and also, of course, as always, if anyone has any questions, if you need any help uh, navigating any sort of federal agency, uh, please do reach out to our office, and I'll be happy to help you in any way that I can, or uh, help connect you with uh, anyone else who can help you as well. And then um, before I leave tonight, I'll be uh, I'll be on for the remainder of the meeting, but um, I'll be sure to send over some of my contact information in the chat as well for anyone who wants to reach out. Great. Thanks, David. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you all. All right. Who else Hi. Uh, my name is Emily. I'm from the Office of Council President Pro Tem Stephen Whitburn. I'm not going to be your regular representative. Uh, that would be Benny Cartwright, but he asked me to step in because there was a conflicting meeting. Um, so we just set dates for two forums that we're going to have with the mayor about the franchise agreement. Uh, we're going to have those on Saturday the 13th at 3 p.m. and Friday the 19th at 6 p.m. We are working to get the links to those forums as soon as possible. Um, so in the next couple of days, we'll be emailing those out to groups like yours so that your members can participate. Um, and I will put Benny's contact information in the chat. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Great, thank you so much. Hi, um, I'm Barbara Garcia Moreno. Uh, joined you before uh, representing uh, uh, Senator Tony Atkins' office. Uh, quick brief uh, update for you um, on a couple of real important things. Uh, SB 91 was uh, just the first thing that uh, legislation tackled when they got back to work in January. Um, and SB 91 took effect yesterday, February 1st, extends the eviction moratorium that had been put in place and uh, it will now go through June 30th, uh, 2021. Uh, that program at the local level is still being worked out. We should know more information later this week, uh, but I will uh, share the FAQ link that we have um, so far uh, to just kind of give you a, a bit of an idea of, of what's in the new bill. Um, and then I also just wanted to remind everyone that round two of the small business grant program through the state is now open. Uh, that goes through February 8th. And the grants are that are available are between five and $25,000. Uh, if anybody already applied, they were considered waitlisted. Um, so they wouldn't have to reapply again. They automatically get re-enrolled. But if you haven't applied, uh, now is the time to do it. So I will be posting both of those links in the chat and my email as well. And it's nice to see everyone. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you so much, Barbara. All right, Officer David. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for allowing me a few seconds to speak to you. Uh, Officer David Swallow, I know we haven't seen each other all in uh, a little bit of a while, but I wanted to touch base tonight. As some of you may know, the mayor has reinfor uh, reinstated the parking uh, enforcement out on city streets. So be aware that right now we're doing warnings, but come February 8th, we'll be doing full enforcement for parking related issues, such as 72 hours um, and extended stays along along your, your streets. So if you have been parking for for periods greater than 72 hours out in front of your apartments, condos or homes, it is something to think about that you'll need to start moving your cars um, and not uh, get yourself a citation. Other than that, I don't really have too much. We're still pressing forward, um, doing the best that we can in these times. Uh, it does look like there's obviously a light at the end of the tunnel with the uh, vaccines coming out. So hopefully uh, this summer we'll be back to normal. Uh, other than that, I don't have anything. What I will do though is put my email address inside of the uh, chat. And if anybody wants to reach out to me, I will spend uh, my day tomorrow answering any questions or concerns that people have so that you guys can move on with your agenda unless uh, the chair has a question for me in particular. I have one pretty general question. Um, sure. The vaccination station at the ballpark, I've noticed there's no traffic control at all for any vehicles coming into the city. 
And I'm just curious why that never was programmed. Um, it just seems like a safety issue for people that live in the urban setting. You, you probably raised a very good question. I have not seen it myself. Um, I don't think that I would be alone in saying I'm a little bit disappointed in the way that the vaccines are being handled right now in regards to being distributed. Um, and you bring up a, a topic that is worth me bringing forward. So I will be setting that up to um, uh, up my chain. I'll send it to my captain, ask that she sends it up to uh, the chief of police to ask uh, about parking enforcement concerns or traffic related concerns related to the uh, vaccine center. I would imagine that as more of these places start showing up uh, in different neighborhoods, that will be something that needs to be considered and evaluated for all locations. So on your behalf, I will push that up. That's a, a great comment. So thank you very much for asking that question. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Yeah. No hey, so Hill, this is, oh, this is David Meyer. I'm with UC San Diego Health, and I've been part of those discussions briefly um, with, uh, regarding the traffic control. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know on the call that it has been raised with um, San Diego PD and the county and obviously our team with the health system to try to um, mitigate any impacts downtown. So there are um, plans that have been put in place to try to mitigate those um, traffic issues and obviously like Dr. Uh, like Officer Cirillo mentioned, um, you know, just the volume that we're trying to um, accommodate at the site is, is one of the big conflicting issues there, but um, doing what we can and, you know, um, making changes as needed. Great, thank you for the update guys. Sure. Right. Do, do, does, he, does, does he happen to know like when those then will be put in place to start seeing some sort of traffic controls or are they planning on moving it to a more appropriate location like you know, a place that had been more easily aggressed and egressed without impacting a, a neighborhood or community. David, do you yeah, want to yeah, officer, I, I could um, definitely, I have your email. I could send you the correspondence that we've been on uh, regarding the traffic issues downtown. Um, and um, definitely we could follow up on, on the plans and where they are now. I know that um, some of the early mitigation efforts for that um, included um, bringing out more uh, traffic control officers and um, obviously the Padres staff is helping with um, traffic um, uh, direction uh, downtown. But yeah, I could, I could definitely follow up with you after this to, to get more information to you. And then uh, we could follow up with Sohil to get more information to the entire group as well. Yeah, thank okay, you. Yeah, if, if you could, thank you. And sure. this, this again, it's just a broad question for our city because at some point maybe there's there's going to be facilities within the uptown neighborhood. I just want to make sure people are uh, forward thinking and uh, we're not bogging down the neighborhoods and, and the residents within these these communities. Um, anyways, I appreciate your time. Can uh, I, can I make a comment on this suggestion? Uh, can, can you wait till public comment? Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, do we have any other elected officials that would like to say anything? Representatives, no? All right, thank you very much. Let's go to public comment. Sharon, go ahead. Okay, about the ballpark. I had uh, experience getting in one of those lines and <coughs> there were a number of lines to explain things to Officer Suelo and feeding into one entrance to the parking lot. I was in a line that's five blocks long. It was going half an hour per block. So I, I found a parking place parked and walked in. I think, yes, you need officers controlling this, but I'd like to suggest that you look on, that, uh, that the hospitals, that the people running the, a lot, tell people that they can walk in, that they can emphasize public transportation. Because once I got in, the line was only 20 minutes long. So if you had more people walking in, if when you advertise that site, you don't just say it's a drive-in, you say it's a drive or walk-in. You let people know that's an option so they can take public transit, they can take Uber, they can be dropped off by family. Maybe they do end up parking in the neighborhood, but that's an imposition on the neighborhood. But those long lines of traffic are worse, I think. So anything we can let people know there's an option. That's great information. And we'll, we'll try to post some of that information too uh, on our end, just to kind of educate people on how to go about doing this. And maybe they'll open up the parking lot and allow cars to just park in the parking lot and then and go to their uh, appointment. Yeah. But appreciate that input. Uh, all right, any other public comments? Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. Uh, public non-agenda then. Please. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Brer. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment about the Balboa Park Committee. Uh, as some of you know, Uptown Planners is allowed to uh, nominate one of its members to serve on the Balboa Park Committee. Uh, over a year ago, uh, this board nominated me for that position, uh, but City Council has not acted on it. Uh, they have not put it on their agenda to seat me. Um, and the seat that is uh, allocated to Uptown Planners is still occupied by Don Liddell, who was seated in 2009 and continues to serve despite there being an eight year term limit on that position. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up again and ask if we could uh, perhaps address that or look into it. Uh, Michael, do you have any comments on the formalities? Is there any other way around this um, without waiting for counsel? I'm not familiar with the uh, process for this appointment, but I can review and follow up at the next meeting. If you don't mind, that'd be great. If you can get me some feedback before the next meeting so we know how to proceed with this and make sure that our executive board member we selected can actually start attending on our behalf um, to represent us um, in Balboa Park. I was just wondering, uh, Mary McKenzie uh, Brer, did who is the person that's been serving? Don Liddell. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? No. All right. Do we have any board comments? Anything anyone wants to share? Has, has anyone got their vaccinations? Have, has anyone got their second vaccination? Yeah. All right. I love it. Just uh, a piece of information for everybody. There are a lot of facilities that end up having extra vaccines. If you go to these facilities towards the end of the day and they have extras, they will give you a vaccination and you do not have to be part of the tiers that they've already admitted. You could be a 21 year old that shows up and gets a vaccination because otherwise they're throwing these things away. So just know that, contact some of the, the, the various locations, get a feel for their hours of operation. And if you really wanna get your vaccination now and don't wanna wait, that's my recommendation. All right. I would uh, second that. I'm vaccinating at the Imperial Beach um, location. So we have people waiting till the end of the day and you know we've been able to accommodate those people. So I'm part of the Medical Reserve Corps for San Diego. Awesome, that's yeah. great. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let us move on to our first action item. Um, this is regarding elections for the Uptown Committee. I'm going to turn this over to Steve and let him uh, take over as, as he is in, you know, the one that running our election committee and knows all the details associated with what we can and cannot do. So, and we had also put out um, some documents on this matter as well. So Steve, welcome. Well, I, I tried to send out a memo today regarding this. I mean, there's a lot of complicated issues involved, but my general position is that it's simply not feasible to pull off an election within the next 30 days when considering the notice eligibility issues involved, whether or not we're going to feasibly suspend bylaws to get around eligibility requirements to serve on the board since we haven't been recording attendance for the last 11 months. But ultimately, I'm not sure if we can get the memo out, but I'm open to questions. But the reality of the situation is I don't think we can pull this off within 30 days. And I think it creates more problems than it's worth. I think the alternative is to suspend the election until further order of the governor but I think there are far too many issues in play to pull off an election within 30 days when the reality is the current board can handle business until such time as we can open up an election. The biggest problem in running an electronic election or any other form of that 
is the voter verification step where we're ultimately asking people to provide identification, residency information, how would we transmit that electronically? How would we transmit that by mail? Uh, how do we pull all that off within the next 30 days? So uh, overall, my view on this, I I've talked to the other members of the election committee at different points, but I think the consensus is that it is not feasible to pull off an election before the next meeting. And as a result, the alternative, the only alternative we have and I believe Mr. Prince can probably confirm this is if we don't have it in March, we do not have the option of delaying it for a period of months or two months or so on. It's either we have it or we suspend it. And I, I just don't think it's feasible to have it under the current timeline. Very well. Thank you for that. Uh, I would like to start with some public comments uh, on this matter and then we'll switch to board comment. Are there any members of the public that have any questions or comments? So, Hill, could we have could we have Michael Prince chime in first? Yes, we can. Michael. Yeah. So, uh, to answer Steve's question directly, or question, but the sort of the the point that he raised directly, the current guidance that was released to all of the CPG chairs and that was discussed at CPC is to provide and allow for guidance to allow for elections to occur at the regular March meeting consistent with each group's bylaws and council policy 624, which governs planning group operations and elections. Sorry for the long winded sort of answer, but that's sort of the background. So within that guidance that was, that was established by the department after sort of internal review, there were two options that were established. Option number one is to move forward consistent with the guidance for allowing for mail-in or electronic voting um, consistent with uh, county and CDC guidelines. Option two is to delay the election until after the state of emergency has been lifted. As of right now, there is not a provision um, or an allowance within the guidance that allows for a delay um, within the time frame of say a couple of months, unless, you know, again, a couple of months from now, uh, everyone is vaccinated and the governor's uh, orders are lifted and both city and county uh, return to some form of normalcy of in-person meetings. Again, I apologize for sort of the lengthy answer to your question, but the guidance does not uh, allow for, or does not sort of provide an option, I should say, because uh, ultimately planning groups are self-governing and it's your determination to make in terms of how best to interpret the council policy and the bylaws. Um, and I know I'm throwing in a lot of caveats here, but the short answer is I would say is, is that the group should, based on the guidance, find a process that is consistent with the guidance to complete the elections in March or delay them until the uh, state of emergency is lifted. That's the short of it after a very long sort of circuitous comment, apologies. Uh, Steve, do you have any comments to Michael's response? Hey, you gotta take yourself off mute. No, I, I think that's consistent with what I said. Um, it's unfortunate that the guidelines came out on January 19th with our election being in early March there's nothing that ultimately we can do about that, but when we consider all of the steps that normally occur in a, an election process that usually takes a few months to pull off, I know this from having planned the last election that we canceled at the last moment, um, I don't see it being feasible to pull this off within 30 days without dramatically suppressing eligible candidates and voters. Okay, thank you for that. All right, now to public comment on this matter. Do we have anybody that would like to make a public? Oscar, please go, go ahead and take yourself off. Uh, there you go. Um, I think um, for the committee to review the eligibility of everyone, I think it's definitely understood that whether the people were attending and taking um, whether this is an official recording and whoever uh, attended is part of the attendance. So I think it's important to clarify whether the three meetings rule is still gonna be enforced. And uh, I definitely wanna 
uh, agree with the statement that safety matters first and <clears throat> that it doesn't make sense to rush the process just because the bylaw say it has to be done in March. The only thing is that I would probably ask for the committee to um, and the entire board as well to come together after, you know, some time when the governor removes the stay at home order and actually make a motion to create uh, an election mid year, post year, or at an earlier time frame, not just wait till the next cycle in March. So I definitely understand we should wait and be safe. However, when the time comes up, I would definitely ask for everybody to. Uh, consider that the elections should resume and similar to what we have done in previous years. Great, thank thank you. you. Any other public comments? Uh, Sharon, go ahead. I read through the, um, the uh, uh, paperwork that went with this uh, motion, a supplemental information for this meeting. Mm -hmm. And it was very complicated, the guidelines for doing things correctly if you did drive through or in person. And it would be very hard to do that, to make sure we were doing all that. And I looked through our, our bylaws and trying to make, it's impossible. It would be impossible to do everything we would have to do in a, such a short period of time. And as Steve said, we would not be able to get word out to enough people. We would not have the normal number of people know about this meeting and have the option to come. It's Thanks. unfortunate. It's frustrating. It's very, very frustrating. Thank you for the comment. Uh, please raise your hand if you'd like to make a public comment so I can see you on my screen. All right, Lou, welcome. Hi, thanks. Um, I would like to uh, sort of follow up a little bit on something that Oscar mentioned about attendance. And Steve, I, I appreciate you and the election committee taking the position that you do because the, I too, like Sharon, looked at all those regs, looked at the bylaws and said, how do you do this well, especially issues of outreach um, that, that are so much a part of what the committee wants to, the election committee wants to do. Um, but you, you said, Steve, that there's no way to uh, uh, keep track of the attendance over these last months when we've been meeting virtually. And I think that actually that is possible. Now, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be some adjustment to what the expectations are. Um, those are all things for the election committee to consider, but I don't think it's impossible to know who's been attending the meetings, that that actually is a matter of record that you could unearth um, what you want to do with that information, how you might want to flex what the expectations are. I, I don't know, but it's something for the committee to consider. And the last thing I'd like to say about that is I hope the election committee will not just go away now until the, the state figures out what, what's possible for us next. If, if in fact the, there is an election canceled that the election committee start looking at those issues. What, what is possible to know about attendance? What eligibility criteria might, might you wanna propose as alternatives? Um, is it possible that as online meetings have become more normative that you might in fact want to have an online way to certify people and have a, a, an alternative voting method than what we've done in the past? I know those are big, questions and issues, and I certainly don't expect anyone to even, you know, want to weigh in substantively on them now, but I would uh, encourage the, the, the board to encourage or charter the election committee to say, do some background work with regular meetings and report back to this larger group uh, over the months while we're waiting for things to change about, uh, so that there is uh, more preparation um, next time for these extraordinary circumstances we're in. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right. Do we have anyone else? Please raise your hand so I can see you. Someone on this screen. No. Oh, all right. Michael Gronovan has his hand up. Go ahead. Thanks, Ohio. Um, while I agree that trying to do this within 30 days would be uh, a Herculean effort. Uh, I would like to know if it's possible either for the board to uh, make a bylaws change or for the city council to uh, make a temporary change to policy to allow the election to be delayed. Okay, thank you. 
All right, let us go to our board members for comments. I'll just uh, look at your icons here and pick at you one at a time. Uh, Mr. Dahl, do you have any comments on this matter? <clears throat> uh, no, I, since I'm up for election, I'm listening more than speaking. All right. Uh, Mr. Daniel, would you like to make any comments? I know you were part of the election subcommittee. I can, yes, I can make a couple of comments. Um, first of all, once we got the, the 19th email, we went through it and immediately started to investigate what we thought could be done and in what time frame. And as Steve Klein pointed out, the biggest problem was qualifying eligible voters to the degree that we wouldn't be suppressing voting by trying to jam it all into a couple of weeks uh, in preparation for a March 2nd. And then we um, looked at the alternatives that were suggested and some of them are workable provided we had time. The electronic one, the mail-in or drop-off one and having some method of the eligible voters submitting their eligibility documents, all of that can be done. But if you try and jam it all in to a March 2nd timeframe, it's going to suppress voters, it's going to eliminate candidates, and it's just not fair to the general public. We always thought that there was an option to postpone short term, but it turns out that that was an incorrect option stated in the June, in the uh, January 19th letter. So all I'm doing is emphasizing the fact that we're gonna work at it. We're gonna figure out how to do it now that we've got these guidelines. We just need to know when to turn the switch from off to on. So, so forgive my ignorance here. Um, maybe you already mentioned it, but uh, are we able to push the elections out like three months from now or does it have to be held in the month of March? And does that mean we have to wait till next March to hold this election? I mean, how no, no. My, understand, my understanding from Michael Prince's comments is that we can delay it a few months until the governor releases some of the current restrictions. That was my understanding of what Michael Prince said. Otherwise, we would be waiting until next March if those restrictions aren't lifted. lifted At one point, three of us on the subcommittee thought, man, one of the lines in here says, or postpone their March 2021 elections. I thought, great, we can postpone it for three months. But it turns out that there is more to it than that. Understood. Thank you for that clarification. All right. So, Mr. Daniels, do you have any comments? I was just going to add to the question of what other groups are doing. One of this was a, discussed in length at the CPC meeting last Tuesday. I think that the general consensus is everybody's going through the same. Um, thought process that this discussion is going through as well. I think um, some community planning groups, I feel like are gonna try to do something, uh, but I think they're still trying to figure out what that something is. Um, but I would also say too, there was significant concern, particularly from the North Park planning group, as well as the Golden Hill planning group that some of the city's guidance and some of the things you might have to do to get ready in the next um, 30 days would require a change to your bylaws. And the concern would be that if those bylaws aren't approved by the city council, that we would be in violation of the bylaws, which would then put the charter of this group with the city council at risk. Um, so that was something else that was discussed at length and, and was a serious concern of a number of uh, the other community planning groups. So I, all that being said is I would support what Steve and Bob have, have laid out and I would support what the public has said in terms of you know, once that stay at home order is lifted, let's try to figure something out as quickly as possible, not delay again until March 2022. But um, it's, it's a tough situation, but the, the risks to me outweigh the, the benefits of trying to charge forward in 30 days. Very good. Thank you. So, uh, yes, sir. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, this might be a good time to also address the issue of the three vacancies that are on the board. Uh, those are time stamped called by, by appointment of the board for replacements. Uh, how does that, this would be a good time to 
Okay. Let's uh, we'll circle back to that. In a minute. Um, Breer, do you have any comments on the elections? No. Yes. No. Go ahead. I do have a couple of thoughts regarding the attendance issue. I would recommend that any attendees who would like their uh, presence recorded could type their name in the chat box. Um, obviously, if we're saving chats, then that will be at least a record of this. Uh, it does state people's names. Uh, as far as conducting elections, I've mentioned a few months back when we began discussing this, that there were uh, online voting uh, applications that North Park had looked into that seemed to have some potential. Um, I think at the time it was uh, it was said that these would not be accepted, but given the current state of things, I mean, maybe we could make something work with that. Um, and as far as the issue of the recent vacancies, uh, the bylaws do outline uh, how we can fill those. And I believe that those should will need to be filled during the election. I don't think we can just appoint people on that. Thank you. Uh, let's go, Gail. I'm just going through my screen, so I'll get to you guys. I, I see some hands are up, but Gail, go ahead. Um, you know, I, don't, I really don't have any comment on the election, but I just wanted to have one more comment. Um, Amy, since she resigned, she was the chair of the Historic Preservation Committee, which is a committee of this um, of Uptown Planners. So we'd have to put that on the agenda for, for next time, nominating somebody for that. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Matt Medeiros, please go ahead. Yeah, so I, I've got a few things um, on this um, to speak to a couple of the points that I think have been raised, um, you know, following the discussions uh, with Steve and Bob on the election subcommittee here recently, um, and, you know, trying to think through the ways this would be done. I think what we'll probably end up doing is uh, um, setting up a subcommittee meeting for operations and outreach, um, along with the elections committee as kind of a joint meeting at some point here in the near future to try to get ahead of this a little bit before, um, you know, we get the, the governmental approval to move forward. Um, that way we can address what's in the bylaws, what options do we have so that we can at least look at this from a couple of different, different avenues moving forward. Um, and not get caught with our, uh, our kind of feet in the mud. So we will take a, a deeper dive on that and certainly we'll public notice that. So if anyone out there wants to be involved in that meeting um, and, and put their input into that, we will uh, we'll set a date here, uh, hopefully for some time in the next month or so. Um, beyond that, um, the other question someone brought up, you know, bylaw wise with the three folks that have, uh, have fallen off the board, um, two of those folks actually um, termed out back in March. So under our bylaws, those two, two would not be replaced under this scenario uh, from the standpoint that filling the remainder of their term, there is no term remaining, so there is no fill. Uh, in Zach's case, it's a little different. He has two years remaining on his term. Um, so we have by the bylaws 120 days to fill that spot. And since there is no election being held in that time frame. Um, we will need to, you know, start taking applicants uh, or folks who would want to fill his slot, um, and that would be approved by the majority vote of the board as it stands now for those selections. So we'll finalize that process. Um, we will we will try to get that as an agenda item for the next meeting. Um, so again, it'll be 120 days. So we'll we'll by the next meeting we'll lay out how we need to apply, you know, eligibility requirements for that position. Um, so we'll have to work on that a little bit. And, you know, I'm hoping that uh, Michael can kind of uh, take us through a little bit of that process offline just to make sure we don't miss anything through that. Um, so I think that answers that other question. And, you know, again, it's, this is something that is in current flux and movement and we'll try to adjust the best way possible. Um, you know, and, you know, working with Michael, we can maybe try to get some bylaw changes done. I'm not positive how much uh, was recorded by Zach and or anyone else as far as uh, attendance at prior meetings. 
So we want to check with that because also based on bylaws, the attendance from 2019 to 2020 is irrelevant because it's only the last 12 months. So if people attended meetings and were on last year's slates to be elected mm -hmm. under our current bylaws, that's irrelevant. Um, so we really need to dig down on this and address those issues from the standpoint of whether we're going to hold it, have a temporary reprieve on attendance. We'll have to look on a couple of different ways, again, so we don't disenfranchise the voters or people who don't have access to a computer as easily as others. You know, there are a whole lot of things that have gone on here, and we need to really take those things into consideration so that we're not uh, playing favoritism to those of... Uh, higher echelons of, of wealth or, you know, of location or whatever else the case might be. Matt, I appreciate your thoroughness and I appreciate the fact that you've been proactive with the election subcommittee to collaborate on future meetings, which will help keep us ahead of the curve at least a little bit until we hear back from, from the government. Uh, Tom, please, uh, do you have any comments, sir? You gotta, you gotta take your mute button off there. In here. I can hear you. Yeah, I appreciate the work that Stephen Klein did to look at this issue, and and his conclusion may be correct. But before we we accept that, um, I'm I'm always reluctant to say something can't be done. So I contacted the other five groups that are that also have uh, pl the uh, community planning group meetings the first week of the month. So uh, all five groups confirmed that they're going to hold an election the first week of March. And I asked them how they're going to do that. Well, uh, City Heights is going to do a, a ballot drop off. Um, Ocean Beach is going to do a mail in or a drop off. They're also exploring the third method for online, but they've been doing mail in ballots before. They don't see a problem with mail in or drop off. Rancho Penasquitos is going to do a drop off. Um, La Jolla is going to do a mail in. Although the chair also told me if someone wanted to drop off at any of the board members' homes, they could do that too, but it's primarily the mail-in. Scripps Ranch is gonna do a drop-off. So uh, again, I'm, I'm reluctant to say something can't be done. Here's five planning groups who were doing it. Uh, if there is an interest uh, at the end of board comment, I've actually drafted a schedule for how to get it done in the next four weeks. Um, Stephen may find that it's not in compliance in some manner, but, uh, I did a schedule and found that there's plenty of time. I'd be I'd be willing to share that. So, Tom, just real quick, uh, did you attend any of the election subcommittee meetings? No. What I did, I went to the CPC meeting and uh, Tate Galloway from the city spoke, and he did elaborate a little bit on uh, on the procedure. I, 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 to my knowledge, there were not any meetings of the election committee. Now there were there were there were meetings held within with the members of the part of the subcommittee. And I, I was just wondering if you attended any of those and brought any of these items to their attention. No, I would have liked to. I didn't get any notice. Were, were they noticed meetings? I believe so. Um, all right. Well, just curious because that's the whole point of our subcommittees is to kind of delve into these details and and come come more prepared. Okay. So, Okay. So I wasn't I was invited last year, and I I'm, I wasn't aware of any election subcommittee meetings. Very well, thank you for your comment. Uh, Mr. S uh, we already talked to Mr. Saison. Let me see who else is left on this list. Oh, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you, uh, Sahil. So I think we're fortunate to have enough members who are interested in participating on the board. There are a lot of community planning groups that don't have that option. They're struggling to even keep a, enough members to keep going, as, as if I understand correctly. Um, so I guess, we could say we live in interesting times. Uh, ultimately, um, if it's good enough for the governor to postpone things, regardless of how you might feel about the governor, um, if that's a reasonable strategy at that level of government, then okay, well, maybe we should do that rather than rush it um, and try to do a, a thorough job of letting people know that they can run and that they can vote and that this is how we do it. So uh, I don't think there's a problem waiting. We've waited this long already with people who should not be on the board now as a result of 
of uh, you know what has happened in the last year, but they're still on it and nothing horrible has happened. The worst thing that could happen is the committee would become non-functional because of lack of a quorum or lack of a minimum number of members. So I'm, I'm okay with um, going uh, with following the letter of the law according to the, our elected uh, officials who are directing us. And if we can speed it up, all the better. But I think trying to speed it up to the detriment of fairness would be inappropriate. Thank you for that. Uh, Michael Brennan, please, do you have any comments, sir? Yeah, um, I just wanna say thank you to the election subcommittee for stepping up and uh, looking into all these issues. Um, I think, you know, Tom does bring up some interesting points about other community groups that are navigating this. And, you know, it, it may or may not be too soon, um, you know, to hold our election in three weeks or whatever time it is, but maybe we can learn from these other CPGs that are going ahead of us. And, um, you know, maybe an election can be held before, you know, a future um, call from the governor removes the emergency orders in place. Um, so, you know, safety first. And um, if we can get an election in there, learning from these other groups, I think that's great too. But thanks for your work on all this. Good, thank you. Mr. Ellig. I would also like to thank Steve and Bob and the rest of the subcommittee uh, for doing this. And I concur with both of them as to their feelings. Uh, safety first, let's not rush this. Uh, concern of mine is that it be adequately publicized so that people within the community um, know about, you know, uh, if they want to be on it, they can have their, they can attend the meetings that, it, that the people know when the, the election is going to be, et cetera. So I'm, I'm in total favor of uh, delaying this until the, uh, the emergency order is, uh, is lifted. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, Stu McGraw, any comments? Yes. Uh, where did we land on um, if we're allowed to postpone three months, did Michael Prince say? Yes, we well, it we have to wait for the gov governor to, to actually make the determination. So us, per, us postponing three months doesn't really make sense because we, we're still going to be restricted by the governor's orders. So um, maybe we can make a plan, but yeah, no, I was just going to sort of reiterate that the, that the guidance uh, directs or the guidance addresses the options for the March elections um, or the ability to uh, to postpone until the governor's orders are lifted, and it's it it does not um, explicitly allow for or direct the an interim uh, election procedures. Uh, you know, I would just sort of go back to that and say ultimately that the groups are self-governing and it is your sort of, uh, it is, is the board as a whole and, you know, together with the community to determine um, whether or not you're consistent with the overall intent of the council policy and, 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 and you know, overall sort of achieving those primary objectives. So again, the groups are self-governing, but the guidance itself does not sort of offer that up as, as a, um, an alternative. So I would be willing to um, help the election subcommittee to be ready for something instead of making a plan when the governor lists. Uh, is order. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, Steve, you're raising your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, just a couple of follow-up points here. First, everyone needs to understand we didn't get this until January 19th or thereabouts. We have not had time to have a formal subcommittee meeting. I've had phone calls with just about everybody involved. And understanding Tom's interest in this from the last election cycle that I prepared the election on, I've been communicating directly with Tom on this and conveying my thoughts. Tom has given me his schedule. Um, it would be great to pull that off, but the the timeline he has laid out is not feasible. Beyond that, it leaves out the most time consuming part of that, which is vetting the voters, not the candidates. 
there's no step in there by which we vet all these voters in terms of what documentation they're going to send in, whether or not we're actually going to accept that documentation and be responsible for either storing or destroying it or conveying it electronically. There are just an unbelievable can of worms here in terms of things that we simply don't have adequate time to address. And that's all assuming that the bylaw question can be addressed sufficiently so that we're not putting our charter at risk by saying, let's bypass all these bylaws. I mean, even if we were gonna sit down and try to go through all the video recordings to see who was present, I don't know that we have a viable group of candidates within the next week. And we're talking about Tom's schedule posting the candidates and bios by next week, which I just don't think is feasible. You know, I want to have an election as much as anybody, but we need to do this safely. We need to do this smart. And I just don't see the upside to jamming this through for the sake of having it in March. So, Haley. Yes, sir. In the interest of getting us to move on from this subject, if we're going around in circles, may I make a motion? I would appreciate that. Please. And the motion is that we postpone elections until a government uh, announcement that allows us to proceed is made, and that during that period, the election committee continues to work towards an online election in the event we need to have that. Do I have a second to this motion? Second. Hi. All right, let me, uh, let me get uh, a vote with all your hands raised and I'll read your name. Mike, um, so you know, before you do the vote, can I ask Michael whether or not the people that are up for election should should abstain or whether he feels that they should vote on this? I don't have a good answer for you there. I apologize. I think it's probably up to um, the individual member to, to make a decision. I don't see a particularly egregious conflict here on this one, but at the same time, sort of without having to review it, I'd sort of say, use your best judgment. Thank you. Uh, Dennis, <laughs> can I, I know it's already been seconded, but if, uh, if you'd accept an alteration, because you did say online election and, you know, we might have a mail-in, it might be ability to go live. I just want to be able to have more leeway and not be uh, pigeonholed to that. Uh, Absolutely, that's, I meant to cover that. Okay, very well. All right, uh, can I get all in favor to raise your hands, please? And I will read your names one at a time before you put them down. Um, I've got Stephen Klein, I've got Clint Daniels, Bob Daniel, uh, Bruce Marsh, Gail Freed, uh, Dennis Saison, Bill Smith, Michael Bowen, um, Stu McGraw. Let me see, am I missing anything here? Okay, and then let's go those in opposition to this motion. Please raise your hands. I have Tom Mullaney. Okay. And abstention, please raise your hands. I have uh, Mr. Elig abstaining. And abstaining. All right, motion passes. So, Hale, if I may make a comment for the record, I am one of those that is up for re election. I do not intend to present myself, and so did not see a conflict. Most terrible. All right, uh, just a, a, a one overall comment to this, ladies and gentlemen, if please. Volunteer your time, show up to our monthly meetings. You know, your voices will be heard at these meetings. You do not have to sit on the executive board to make productive comments for the better of our community. So please attend until we figure out what we can do. Thank you so much. All right, let's go on to, the, yes, Did someone say something? Well, there's an uptown planners meeting Who is this? Oh. right here. That's using my cell phone battery. And I have to go back for the plumber. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure who that was. I just put somebody else on mute. All right. <laughs> um, 
Uh, this is Mary McKenzie again. Can you just, uh, I know I'm not a board member. Can I speak? We just finished that item, Mary. Uh, we're moving on. I to just want to, I just wanted a review of what, what the review of what just came from that item is that we are all in agreement that we're going to postpone elections until the government comes out and tells us it's okay to proceed with elections. Thank so you very much. Thank you. All right. Moving on to the next item, we have Parks for All. Um, we have a presenter this evening, Susan Baldwin, and uh, the item of discussion, Parks and Recreation Coalition, PARC, um, is a volunteer group of professional city planners, uh, park advocates and community planners from around San Diego. In November, they submitted a letter to eight organizations and 34 individuals to city council requesting revisions to the parks component of complete communities and a delay in adoption of the plan. The city council declined to approve the parks component at its November 9th meeting. Park has been working on a specific list of revisions and meeting with public officials, including so city. Are you doing a or no, on? I'm trying to get on the. Um... Okay. Sir, can you put yourself on mute? Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Park has been working on specific lists of revisions and has been meeting with public officials, including city council members and the mayor's office to lobby in support of these sensible and significant improvements. Welcome, Susan. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your giving me the time tonight to speak. And um, I guess I don't really need to make any more introduction except to say that I am a retired city planner and I worked for the San Diego Association of Governments for 27 years. And I also worked for the city of San Diego for about five years um, back in the late eighties. So um, I appreciate you all giving us the time to talk about the improvements that park is asking be made to the parks master plan and recreation element of the general plan. So I have a slideshow that I'll be giving you. And um, so why are we here? We love parks, um, we need parks and parks are really vital to everyone. And this has been especially illustrated during the pandemic. And as you know, the city is proposing a new parks master plan with significant changes to park standards and the way development impact fees are calculated for parks. This is the first parks master plan in 50 years and we appreciate uh, greatly the efforts to make equitable investments into our park system. And park supports addressing the inequities in the parks planning and allocation processes um, that have been historically um, a problem in the city. And we also support the citywide park fee, though we do have some questions about how it is being calculated and how much money would be raised by it and also how it would be allocated. So um, again, we appreciate the amount of time and commitment that city staff was able to put into the plan. And we do though feel that there was an artificial deadline um, set by the former mayor and there was not enough time provided to address significant concerns that we believe can be addressed now. Um, also, this presentation is going to cover a lot of material. And so if you want to take notes and uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions that you might have at the end. <clears throat> so again, we strongly believe that, um, whoops, I think I skipped. Oh, yeah. We strongly believe that, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, that the community planning groups and recreation advisory groups should be involved in the equitable um, park planning process. And um, uh, we feel that it's inadequate to have only made presentations to the community planners committee and in the Zoom era, we believe it's faster and easier to engage with community planning groups. Sorry, somehow I got mixed up here. Um, we've identified five major issue areas with the parks master plan. One of the biggest issues is the elimination of the current land standard. And we feel this is a problem just when we're 
increasing housing density and incentivizing smaller units. We support the need for flexibility for communities to add recreational amenity into parks, but there should still be an easily understandable land standard. We believe that more people in the city will need more parks, not just more amenities added into existing parks. As with affordable housing, which is the arena I worked in at Sandag, um, just because we can't meet the goals doesn't mean that we shouldn't have them. And we have also found that no other city, uh, we have found no other city that doesn't have a clear land standard. And uh, while the city held many meetings for input into the plan, after the plan was released, the prior administration invested most of their time in the housing and mobility components of complete communities. And we feel push the parks master plan forward um, based on an artificial deadline. And as I mentioned, um, the only uh, uh, outreach to the community planning groups was through the community planning uh, committee, planners committee, and we don't think that is um, adequate. Funding, we all know that there's not enough funding um, for the park system, and we have some ideas that we believe could be helpful. Also, the prioritization framework is um, important, and that has to do with how the money that will be raised will be allocated. And this, we believe this um, prioritization framework should be released as soon as possible. And um, in the staff report on November 9th, it was, it was identified as being released in January. Um, number four, the point system is complicated. That's replacing the land standard. And as the first such approach that's being tried by any city, we believe it needs much more discussion and potentially changes. Other issues that we've identified are listed in the fifth bullet, commercialization, um, habitat planning, uh, habitat um, land, uh, historic resources, design review, and implementation issues. So going to limited vision. Um, the problems with the existing system are not related to the standard of more land for parks that exists now. The need for additional park land really remains the same, yet the parks master plan and recreation element devalue and reduce standards for more park land higher intensity housing, smaller sized units, and more people increases the need for more parkland, not just adding the amenities, as I mentioned earlier, into existing parks. We believe that having no benchmark for new parkland means that there's no standard to determine the need for land and that park deficiencies are essentially wiped out if we don't have a land standard. We believe that the park acreage standard should be retained. Um, we understand that limited open land and rising acquisition costs make it increasingly difficult to meet the acreage based standard, but we don't think we should give up. With a projected population increase of about 350,000 people during the next 30 years, we feel it would be harmful to adopt a policy which aims to primarily use existing parks to satisfy our residents' park and recreation needs. More people, we believe, need more parks. Um, also, uh, protections are needed for open parkland for passive recreation, and they need to be improved those protections, existing passive park lands are put at risk due to the incentives in the point system, which I'll talk about in a little, little bit later. The only way to really ensure that more park land is set aside is to set aside a fund for it. And a minimum percentage of 10% was proposed in the staff report on November 9th, um, the, uh, uh, percentage of 10% going to parkland acquisition, we think that that percentage, if, if that's the route that's, that the city decides to head in, uh, should be actually higher. <clears throat> Funding for parks. Um, the development impact fee known as a development impact fee diff system 
uh, both the existing and proposed, um, is not a sufficient source of funding to meet the city's park needs. Um, also, development impact fees, as you may or may not know, cannot be used for operations and maintenance. Therefore, first, we believe that the city should commit to other funding sources and build support for them beginning with this plan. Second, um, the existing recreation element contains policies for the city to determine the correct level of fees for non-residential uses. And currently DIFs are only paid by residential projects. Um, there are other cities that charge uh, other types of uses um, for park fees and the city should retain this policy and look into um, creating some additional funding through that method. Third, community benefit zoning is a method for the city to share in the increased value associated with upzoning properties rather than giving property owners increased density for free. Um, the downtown of San Diego has a community benefit zoning program, um, also known as land value recapture, that has raised millions of dollars for urban improvements downtown. We believe that this type of program should be analyzed as community plan updates are done as a way to fund public facilities. Fourth, the formula that establishes the development impact fees consists of construction costs, contingency costs, administrative overhead, and a land component that is called right-of-way costs. Um, these land costs are based on a set of 24 parks that were recently completed or under construction to inform uh, the diff part of the land component of the development impact fee. But this component is then discounted by 60%. We wonder if this is a fair discount. Um, we've been un unable to get uh, information about the justification for this ju discount, discount, sorry. Um, and we believe that transparency is critical when you make such a significant change um, in how, uh, um, how development Im impact fees are being uh, generated. Next, addressing inequities. This is really a key component of the Parks Master Plan that we wholeheartedly support. Um, as we all know, redlining and other discriminatory policies have shaped the location of housing, freeways, businesses, and parks that affect health in uh, the health of today's urban landscape. Um, specific to parks, researchers have identified that increased heat islands have left some areas several degrees hotter than others. So in, to achieve equity goals, one has to follow the money, both how it's raised and also how it's spent. So one of the first things that we think um, needs to be looked at in the existing system that has led to inequities is, is the fact that the city has been allowing large developments to waive 100% of their development impact fees by satisfying park requirements on their own sites. While this works very well for those communities, it provides nothing for other parts of the city. And we are recommending that a minimum fee be paid into the citywide park fund by all developers, even if they're providing facilities on their own site. Second, staff has not responded to, to our questions seeking to determine the assumptions that made, make up the more than 1 billion in development impact fee estimates for the new system and for the old, um, the time frame and the assumptions that have been made are really critical to understanding whether the new system will generate more fees um, or less funding overall for the system. And it's this transparency in coming up with um, the estimates for how much money will be generated is really, really important. And third, the staff report in the November hearing noted that the engineering and capital projects um, department was already working on the prioritization framework with an update to council policy 814, which is called prioritizing capital improvement program projects. The report stated it is anticipated that this update will include a new focus on communities of concern, 
park deficient communities and communities anticipated to experience the most residential growth. This policy we believe needs to be released as soon as possible. Now, moving on to the complicated point system, um, the plan needs to be straightforward for staff and the public to understand. Um, one of our members of our group, um, who's on the planning group for Pacific Beach, um, asked some of the Pacific Beach planners to go out and look at using the point system um, to determine whether the, there would be, they would be more or less park deficient under the new plan and also to sort of get some experience with it. Um, they found it to be confusing and complicated. And an example of where the points don't make sense are many, but here's just one. A sign and a one acre park each have the same point value in the system. Um, this combined system of land and amenities, they're combining both land and amenities in this point system, creates bad incentives. And it could lead for lead developers when they're providing the facilities that they might provide on site to providing smaller parks filled with recreational amenities um, because amenities tend to be less expensive than the land. So we think that the point system does not adequately, also does not adequately protect habitat lands or um, protect passive parkland from the play everywhere emphasis. <clears throat> After a lot of thinking about the system, our recommendations are to simplify the point system by separating land standards from recreational amenity points to better define the application of the point system. We feel that using it for creating the development impact fees makes sense, but using it for community plan updates we think is questionable. Um, <clears throat> regarding the separation of community planning usage from diff usage, the major use of the point system, again, is to calculate the development impact fees and to make decisions about what these developers would build on site. And we, we think that, again, that that makes some sense, but using it for community plan updates, um, we, we question. Okay, I'm getting close to the end of the presentation. So um, there are a few other issues that we feel need to be addressed. Um, one is commercialization of public parks. Uh, there's language in the recreation element now that we think is simple and elegant, protect parks from commercialization and privatization. And we believe that the language that has been added to the draft recreation element is overly broad. And some of that language is shown in the red. Um, it's not limited to, other retail uses are allowed, other similar uses. We think this language really needs to be tightened up. We're not opposed to commercial uses in some of our parks, but we think there needs to be stronger oversight. Um, with respect to historic resources, parks in the city have many historic resources, but they are barely mentioned in the parks master plan and not even discussed. Um, we think that we should document, the city should be documenting those resources in the plan and that more staff training is needed to protect them. With respect to open space and the multiple species conservation plan, many groups are concerned about encroachments into habitat reserves and we need to ensure that they are adequately protected. Um, we believe a robust public review process is needed for any trails that would be allowed in these um, legally protected um, areas. Park quality and design review. Um, design really matters in, in the park system and we believe it is not adequately addressed in the plan. We don't believe that standard, the standards alone will provide the high quality parks and facilities that will meet the needs of our communities. And to imp we believe that the, the city should be rebuilding the parks and recreation development department, I'm sorry, with, um, with design professionals and landscape architects. And we also believe that the city should reestablish the citywide park design review committee and include policies and criteria for the planning and design of parks.
implementation. Um, the citywide development impact fee is proposed to be adopted by municipal ordinance, not just, and I'm sorry, by a resolution. We believe it should be adopted by municipal ordinance, which has a stronger force of law. Again, the prioritization framework, this is really, really important. How is this money going to be spent? How is it going to meet the goals of equity that are so important to our city? And lastly, I wanna men mention that we also think that the city should be doing an annual report on the implementation of the Parks Master Plan um, and that that uh, report should be put out to the public for review and comment on an annual basis. Um, despite the fact that there are a lot of improvements that we are suggesting here, we believe that these can be accomplished in a reasonable time frame, and we have been put a lot of time and effort into being very specific about the kinds of changes that we are asking for. So parks are and local parks and green spaces really play a crucial role in maintaining our physical and mental health. And um, that has never been made more evident than during the pandemic. Um, we also want to note that park proximity can help with um, funding uh, and money in the city by increasing property values and uh, attracting new businesses and, and visitors to a world-class park system. We are asking, we are going out to all the planning groups. We are asking for a motion to support the improvements that we are suggesting. And we are asking that a letter be sent to the mayor and city council requesting that city staff be directed to work with planning groups like yourselves, the recreation advisory groups and the parks and recreation coalition. And I wanna end on this um, quote that was in the Union Tribune in 1969. A park is unlike any other asset in the city. It is not a building, not a production line, nor a warm breeze. A park is a living, growing thing that will die if the will of the people dies or it will flourish as much as they want it to. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great. I appreciate the presentation and I appreciate the thoroughness of, uh, of your group. Uh, all right, let us uh, start with some public comments on this and we're gonna limit the public comment to a minute. Um, so can you remove the share screen, please, Susan? Sure. All right. Uh, looks yeah. like let me just um, just let me let me just do one thing. I want to, um, in case you guys need the motion, mm -hmm. I'm going to put it in the chat Perfect. as a you know just. A, okay. All right, uh, Lou, your hand is up. Go ahead. We'll, we'll, please make your public comment. Okay. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I had gone to an earlier city meeting where the the park plan was proposed and I was so appalled at the point system and, and at the positive support that seemed to be happening from city officials. I was really dreading that that would go through. I really appreciate the work your group is doing and for the other, besides the, the point system for all the other things you're addressing, commercialization, historic resources, equity, biodiversity, commercialization, I said that design, they're really important. I urge the board as I expect it will to support this uh, resolution that you've proposed and, and really want to encourage your your group to make it so. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Any other public comments? Please raise your hand if you'd like to make a public comment. I do not see any other hand. Oh, there we go. Carol, welcome. You got to unmute yourself, Carol. You got it? There you go. Thank you very much for all the work your group has done. It's so meaningful. And I just want our community to support you in every way possible. Thank you, Carol. All right, did I see any other hands? Uh, Sharon, please. Go ahead, Sharon, take yourself. When we were in the community plan for our town a couple of years ago, I remember the city talking, uh, talking some about the new approach to parks because of older neighborhoods didn't have. So one of the requirements for square parks was just 
it's established for suburban areas. And then you were applying those rules to areas. And we need to be a little about how we do this. For instance, we have a lot of canyons in the area. We can add, make those canyons use if we start putting trails through them. There are different ways of having in an area. And they were in doing this program, they were trying to come up with different ways that appropriate neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, I don't remember everything said. Only if Michael Prince could could talk to us about what any department has the. Hey, it's Karen. a little big decision on this when you only hear one side. Karen, I'm sorry, but you were glitchy through that whole comment. I'm not sure if it's something with the internet on your end. Um, if you want to type your comment, please do so, so we have it posted, and then we can maybe have Michael weigh in on, on what you're requesting. Uh, all right. Uh, do we have any other public comment? No? Okay. Let us go to Bor... Oh, uh, Susan, hold on a second. Okay. We'll come back to you. That's we'll fine. Let's go to our board. Um, do we have any board members that would like to make comments on this? Uh, presentation. Dennis, I see your hand. Go. Yeah, I, uh, the, the question actually is, this was an amazing amount of work. And how many other people were involved? Thank you for it. And I will take away one item, if nothing else. There's a lot there, but I'm going to take away one item. 10 square feet of a little placard equals one acre of park. How ridiculous can you get? So thank you. Totally support your effort. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, Clint, go ahead, please. So uh, I just want to make a want to make a handful of points, actually. Um, so going back to the CPC meeting, the reason I voted against this item at the CPC was the motion on the table included the uh, notion that money that was dedicated to, I believe it was Mira Mesa's uh, park plans needed to remain in Mira Mesa. I could be wrong with the neighborhood. It was one of the North City neighborhoods. Um, <laughs> one of the intended goals of the city's park plan is to address historic inadequacies, as, as Susan said, in terms of the way that parks are funded. Scripps Ranch, Rancho Carmel Mountain, Del Mar, Highlands, whatever all those North City neighborhoods are, are park rich. And they have loads of money that is being isolated and spent and perpetuating that difference in those communities that isn't being invested in places like Uptown, that isn't being invested in places south of the eight. And that's the reason why uh, Monica Montgomery voted in favor of this plan, why Chris Ward voted in favor of this plan, and why Georgette Gomez voted in favor of this plan is because it helps alleviate those inadequacies in the plan. And when we talk about there is no money and we only talk about diffs, that's not what this plan is proposing. This plan is proposing to redistribute the money for parks from the North City to the urban areas of this city that have historically been underfunded through different metiations of white flight from the urban neighborhoods to the North City, to the suburbization of the North City. And this plan is attempting to rectify those things. And so if we're, if we're gonna have a, a discussion about this, then we should be honest about what we're, what we're discussing. The other issue that you know, I would raise on this is, is that something that Sharon mentioned, which is, is that we're applying a suburban standard for park acreage to an urbanized area. Uptown, we've got a handful of parks. We, I don't disagree that I would like more parks, but that shouldn't mean that we shouldn't look at how do we make our parks better. A playground and a pocket park, a, a new trail through Maple Canyon, those are all things that would be benefited from this plan. Uh, in Uptown, and Uptown would be better off with the plan. Not to say that it can't be made better, but to, this is a, a, a tactic to delay or to um, kill what would be a better plan than what we have now. The, the last point that I would make here is that um, when you look at the parks that we prioritized under this plan, Balboa Park to fare as well, um, Presidio Park fare as well, many of the Uptown parks fare well under this plan. And so we should consider, you know, 
how Uptown would be affected by this and not necessarily, I, I feel bad about being parochial about this, but Uptown's going to fare well because we've been historically left behind and Balboa Park has been one of those parks that's been historically left behind. I would just finish by saying that some of the folks who are on this group who have, who have supported this are the same people who sued the Uptown Community Plan that was approved in 2016 over an EIR to delay and kill the plan to build more housing. So I don't dis, distrust Susan. I know Susan very well, and I think that her motives are genuine, but it's hard for me to look past the group uh, that has folks who have, have, have historically tried to uh, prevent more housing from being developed in this community and prevent this community from moving forward as part of this plan. So I will not support this and I would urge you not to support this either. So yeah, before we move forward, I want to bring a point that I raised at the last meeting. I want to be sure it's in the minutes, which is the one where I objected to any of our representatives like Clint or Rare or whoever else would be going to any uh, outside meetings with the right to vote and represent the opinion of this board without any input from the board. And at the opening statement, Clint mentioned that he voted one way, didn't feel he had the right to vote the other way. I think he ought to go there with the right to vote the way the planning board indicates. So I just wanted that to be part of the record. And I appreciate the comment. And just for the record, the response to that is, there are times where things do not get presented to us in a timely manner and you know the city just doesn't make that effort and having a representative from our board attend these meetings we're counting on them to convey a message and a response that represents our community so um it doesn't represent me well and i appreciate your comments and we will do our best to, to convey the message of our executive board. And hopefully we can get more timely presentations from our local government when it comes to these new uh, plan updates and programs. All right, let me go to the next board member. Um, who else would like to make a comment? Raise your hand, please, so I can just pick you. Mr. Ellick, go ahead. Um, I'd like to thank uh, you know, the whole park group for their, their wonderful effort. Um, I don't, I disagree with Clint. Uh, my, uh, with, with respect, um, I, I don't believe that this is major delay that they're talking about that they could accomplish. I mean, first of all, this was never brought to Uptown planners. I feel that the outreach to the planning groups, to the park and rec advisory groups was, uh, was, was not there. And I don't feel that that's, that's the correct process. Uh, that said, I feel that you know, within you know, a 12 month period that these uh, adjustments could be made, that the outreach could be properly done, and a better product could be uh, obtained that in, that brings the money south of eight and uh, eliminates the, the, the errors that were made because of the, the rush to make a program rather than a good program. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, please raise your hands, board members. Anybody else that would like to make a comment? Uh, Roy, please. Yeah, having gone through the previous process of a, of a plan update and looked at the park plans that we went through and been on subcommittees where we tried to identify parkland to, to acquire and just the frustration that most of it was never going to happen. I appreciate the need to update the plan, but I do think that while Clint identifies some very important points that the real problem is the process. The process needs to go through these committees, these groups and get input. They can ignore that input in the end like they may often do and pass a certain plan, that's fine. But they never took the step of getting the input and getting feedback and finding compromises. And I think that there's clearly some compromises that could be had in this case. Um, yes, we need to make sure that some of these older city parts of the city get proper funding um but it does sound like there's some issues in this plan that lets developers off the hook by not having to come up with additional money to help fund things in general so i think that doing more of a review and supporting this kind of effort is important not that we're supporting the specifics at this point but we're supporting the idea that we need to do more review of this thanks thank you Roy. 
Uh, anybody else? Please, uh, Matt, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, you know, I'm kind of on the fence coming into this and listening to everyone's comments and trying to figure out now kind of which way to go. Um, having attended a bunch of the meetings for the parks master plan, um, which were all readily available to the public to attend. I know they didn't bring them to our committee, but uh, they were pretty easy to get to. And uh, <laughs> you're all welcome to do things outside of this board, certainly to, uh, to further that knowledge on things such as this. But, um, you know, clearly, you know, we can nitpick, we can put a couple more things in place. It's great. Um, in the past, we've used a comment when we talked about, say, the, the promenade and things like that is we can't let the perfect outweigh the, the good. And this plan as it stands today, is it, it's a strong plan. If, if we start delay, 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 at the end of the day, we could end up with nothing. We could end up hurting the, you know, what, what we're trying to do as far as building up and getting some funds into uptown, into downtown. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think we have to prolong this process. So, you know, again, having listened to everything, I'm, um, I would lean everyone toward the uh, toward the no side on 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 this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Breer, go ahead, please. Thanks. Um, thanks for that presentation. Um, I really enjoyed looking at it. Um, but you know, I I think it. I want to point out, and some of you attended the recent Hillcrest Plan Committee meeting, might already kind of be up on this, but. We're in a period where public space is being recognized in our neighborhoods that isn't just uh, a lot with grass in it. We're looking at the right of way and streets and all of the other spaces that we share as potential community spaces. Uh, and I think part of this is in response to the rising land costs and the difficulty uh, in obtaining, you know, dedicated parkland. So I don't, I don't have a problem not capturing new park space at this point because I see a shift, a fundamental shift in how we use all of the other shared space in our community. Um, so that's the only point I wanted to make. Thanks. Sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me see. Anybody else here? On this? Uh, Tom, go ahead, sir. Yes, um, I've been involved with trying to monitor the monitor the, the system here for the last six months. And I think that, that the city's plan was rightly criticized for, for basically dumping the park standard. And I, I realized that um, a city needs park land and it needs amenities on the land. To have a kid's play area, you need a piece of land for that play area and, and you need the play area. So I think, I think the park group is trying to establish, uh, trying to establish a balanced approach to do both, both of those. As far as, making more use out of existing parks. I want to point out the current forecast is to add 350,000 people to the population of the city uh, over the next 30 years. And that's not counting the other 18 cities in the region. So if parkland is not added, th there's no way to squeeze another third of a million people using existing parks. They would be tremendously overburdened. And I fear that people would just wind up staying home rather than use a, a park that was that overcrowded. So I, I think uh, passive parkland, active parkland, facilities, rec centers, I think all, all that's needed. And I think, uh, I think what Susan has proposed is a, is a balanced plan. Thanks, sir. Uh, anybody else that I missed? Uh, Mr. Smith, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, torn. It, both sides make good arguments. Uh, I, I must be missing something, but the closer you get to the city center, the less land you have available. You can't compare suburban park space with uh, center city urban park space. Unless somebody knows something I don't that somehow we could raise enough money or condemn enough property in order to, to expand the acreage of city parks. I look at my own community and, and I love uh, the Trolley Barn Park, and, and, but I look around and go, where else would you put a park? Uh, the kind of park that we're talking about, people have advocated 
more park space. And I, what are you going to do? Just, okay, well, Ed Center? Yeah, maybe. If you build up, you can leave room for park space. But uh, I, I'm torn. I would have to, I don't know how I'll vote on this if it comes to a vote tonight. Uh, I just don't see the magical increase in park space in the highly urbanized areas without tearing down enormous amounts of build, uh, of constructed um, space. Okay. That's my comment. Thank you. Uh, any other board comments? No? OK. I, I just want to make a quick comment before we go back to Susan on this. Um, I've been to a lot of different cities and I've seen some pretty impressive projects where, as an example, you go to San Francisco and in the heart of the city, they have this amazing park that's elevated four stories above the streetscape. And it's part of the main core infrastructure of uh, bus transit, taxis, and, and their BART uh, uh, light rail system. So I think there are ways that we can incorporate parks in creative ways within our urban setting. We are definitely at our infancy in the city of San Diego. We are not a San Francisco, but we can learn from many other metropolitan settings to, to, to see different ways of implementing park space within an urban uh, landscape. Uh, Susan, would you like to uh, respond to some of the comments that you heard? Um, sure. <clears throat> um, not exactly sure where to start. Um, we, we're not trying to de delay or kill this parks master plan. We're trying to make it the best parks master plan that we can make it. And we are concerned that the development impact fee estimates, we, we think it's important to understand what the underpinnings of those are. And is there really going to be the amount of money that's being proposed? We also think that it's absolutely true that the development impact fees that are being proposed, the citywide fee, which will be more flexible and we support it. Um, but we also believe that, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, it's okay, you can move on to another bullet point if you'd like. Um, yeah. Um, well, the, another point I wanted to make was that um, I've lived in the Mid-City area my, ever since I came here in 1981. I lived in University Heights. Um, I live in Kensington now. And um, I hope that El Cajon Boulevard and University Avenue and you know, other places in Mid-City get more housing, more businesses, or become more walkable. And I, I just am really concerned about the mindset that we're built out for parks, but we're not built out for housing. To me, if we're going to add, you know, a lot more people to the, you know, the urban part of the city, which I think makes eminently good sense because it's where there's transit, it's where they're close to downtown, where there are jobs. I, I think it, it is so short-sighted to think that we shouldn't be adding park space. And, you know, we're not, it's been referred, the 2.8 acres per thousand has been referred to as a suburban park standard. The city already has in their recreation element different ways of meeting the park standard. And it's not just, you know, 10 acre or five acre sites. There is an acknowledgement in the city's plans now that different ways, there are different ways of meeting um, those park standards. And um, I mean, I'm really concerned that if there's no park land standard anymore in the city, then we have no more park deficiencies, right. except for based on a point system that mixes land and amenities together. And we, we just don't think that makes sense. Thank so you we're, so Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Uh, We've heard a lot of information. We've heard a lot of points from the public and our board. Um, Susan has presented a motion that she's looking for from our board. Um, can I 
get anybody from our board to weigh in on the motion that- can I, can I say one more thing about the impact fees? I'm sorry. What I wanted to say was that the development impact fees, I don't think I mentioned it enough, but we think that a, a, bond, a bond measure may be needed or is likely needed to actually meet the needs of our growing population and also to deal with the existing deficiencies because development impact fees cannot be used to pay for existing deficiencies or operations and maintenance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, board members, uh, you to help me out here with this. Uh, we have a motion from the presenter. Um, do we have an alternate motion? Do we want to work with the motion that's being uh, requested? Mr. Mr. Chair, just yeah. wanted to um, <clears throat> chime in real quick, Michael Prince. Uh, I don't have anything to add. I just wanted to respond to Sharon's comment about uh, wanting a response from the city on this. And so I am not the expert and I can't uh, speak to the specifics of uh, what Susan presented tonight. Uh, hi, Susan, good to see you. Um, the, but <clears throat> our public spaces and parks planning staff has received and, and is in aware of the presentation and is evaluating that along with all the other input that's been received on the parks master plan effort. And, um, and so it's being considered right now as uh, potential changes are being made. And so that's the extent of my contribution tonight. And if and when I have more information, I can follow up and share that with the group. Um, and we can go from there. But our, our, uh, <clears throat> the other staff that's working on the components related to the Hillcrest Amendment uh, is also aware of this and uh, of the comments as well. So just wanted to add that. Thank you, Michael. All right, going back to the board. Anybody? I yes, sir. Propose a motion that we uh, uh, put forward the motion that Susan has uh, presented, support the improvements of this master plan and recreation element, et cetera. Can I get a second, please? I second that. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's put this motion to vote, please. All right. All in favor, please raise your hands, and I will read your names. We have uh, Tom Mullaney in favor, Roy Dahl in favor, Dennis Saison in favor, Bill Pete in favor. What's uh, the last one? Hugh McGraw in favor. Let me see. Is there anyone else that I missed? No. Okay. We got Bill. Hill. Oh, Bill. There you go. Sorry, sir. Thank you. Was a little skewed. All right, and I have Bill Elig in favor as well. Okay. Was that everyone? Did I miss anybody on that? No. All right. Moving on to opposition. Hey, so, Hill. So, can I just make sure I got the names down? So, I had Tom, Roy, Dennis, Stu, and Bill Elig. And Gail. And Gail. All right, and then uh, the opposition, uh, please raise your hands. I have uh, Clint Daniels, uh, Matt Medeiros, Will Marsh, Bill Smith, and Michael Brennan. And last but not least, do I have any abstentions to this item? Bob, was that you? Bob is an abstention. Okay. Any other abstentions? No? Negative, so Hill. I was voting against the motion. Oh, you were voting against it. Okay, Clint, can you put that on for Bob is uh, voting? Yeah. And what about Stephen Klein? Do we still, is he still with us? Oh. Yes, yeah, Stephen, Stephen uh, you didn't vote on either one of those, so are you abstaining? I thought I, I thought I got counted. I had my hand up in approval. In or approval. approval. Yeah, okay. so. All right. Did I miss anybody? No. So we have no abstentions. So Clint, what's our final count there? So we've got six. Uh, sorry, no. So seven in favor. Tom, Roy, Dennis, Stu, Bill. Gail, Steve, seven, and then six in opposition, Clint, Matt, Brer, Bill, Bob, and Michael. So how many votes do we need for a motion to pass? 
Yeah. You have a quorum, so that passes. Yeah. So, well, we we have we need eight, right? Because we have fourteen members. So, because so he'll, are you abstaining? I guess that's the question. <laughs> because, yeah, that's the question. Yeah. Now this, I think it's a simple, it's a simple majority at this point. Right, but we, we, have, we have vote if there was a tie. Right. So, but is is it required to have eight as the quorum or not? It's a majority of the quorum to carry the day, right? So we need eight majorities for the majority of yeah of the group to pass. We have a quorum for the meeting. No, we yeah, do. it's it's just a simple majority of okay. the of those who are present. Right, and we have fourteen present. So a majority of those present would be eight. Well, right, but chair usually doesn't vote on any of these items. So the majority of the rest of the board have voted in favor of this item. So does that pass or do I need to weigh in on this as well? I don't believe an abstention is a no. I believe it passes based on the seven, six count. At least that's the way I've seen it. Okay, I just, I, correct. I, just I, don't know, I don't know the specific law. So who knows more about the bylaws? Please clarify that this is correct. So, uh, Who's trying to speak? I'm sorry. Tom, you're on mute. Tom, you're on mute. Tom, Tom sorry. Um, I believe there's eight eight votes for. Is that correct? Seven. Uh, Tom, Seven. Stewart, uh, Dennis, Roy, Bill Ellig. No, I counted double. Okay, thank you. Seven. That's right. So seven, four, and six. Okay, thank you. I got that. So going back to my bylaw question, can we confirm that this is? This motion passes as voted, or does it require an eighth vote in favor of this motion? I'm looking. It passes. It passes. Okay. All right. Well, we will draft a letter based on the motion presented, and we'll present that to uh, to the city. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Moving on. Let us go down to some information items. Um, information items, uh, this was mentioned briefly earlier, but just to formalize it, we had two board members that have recently submitted their resignations. One of them was Zach Bunshaft and the other was Amy Hayes. Um, we appreciate the time that they both spent volunteering on this board and uh, good luck to their future ventures. Um, thank you. Uh, let us go to the next item. Uh, this is a clarification item regarding another past board member, Tim Gahagan. Um, Uptown planners would like to clarify the recent removal of Tim Gahagan from the board of directors due to the COVID-19 outbreak and mandates on in March. Tim was unaware that his board term was automatically extended due to the state mandates uh, as his term was due to expire in March of 2020. Uh, we would like to amend that Tim Gahagan was not removed from the board, but retired from the scheduled term. So, and again, thank you Tim, as well for the time that you served on the board. We appreciate your volunteering. Um, let us go to the next item. Um, yes, uh, it's so, so yes. could I comment on that item? Yes, you may. Yes, I would. I would propose um, that we clarify a few things at our next meeting. And one mm -hmm. of them is, is that the the members whose terms expired are being invited to continue their service. And that includes Dennis Saison and Bill Ellig and others and Stuart. And then secondly, that they accept that because uh, Tim Gahagan is just one example. We haven't had any kind of recognition at all that we have members serving now whose terms have already expired. So that's part one. Part two is I think we should have an election of officers. So our bylaws say that we should have had an election of officers last April. Uh, now it's another year. I think we should do that. And it may wind up being all the same people, but um, I, I, think, I think that is something required by our bylaws. Okay, that's duly noted. I'll make sure we add that to next month's agenda and uh, we'll process it accordingly so that it- maybe... And then along with that would go appointment of subcommittee members, uh, historic. And of course, because Amy's gone. And uh, I think it all goes together. You got it. That's great. Okay, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right. Appreciate that. Uh, the next item is an update item. It's a Sandag update. Uh, California Transportation Commission recommended full funding the bike up and down and uptown project. This award will fund the construction of Washington Street and Bachman Place bikeways. That's awesome. Which is phase three of the uptown bikeway network. The 3.3 miles of bikeways will create safe, critical links between uptown, old town, Mission Valley, and Mission Hills, and will build the network of safe bikeways in the urban core of the San Diego region. The award of seven million will be leveraged with the seven million match in Transnet funding. Once we complete final design and plan review, the project is anticipated to begin construction in 2022 and be open to the public in 2024. I love it. These are the types of things I like to see. Have you guys seen all the beautiful bikeways coming up uh, in on Fifth Avenue and Fourth Avenue? It's great to finally see these projects. Yeah. Love it. All right. Uh, and our last information item is project 658548. Uh, this one is tentative map, public utility easement, vacation, public street vacation, plan development permit, and amendment to the conditional use permit number 304755. Site development permit number 531932 to demolish existing structures and build new medical offices and hospital totaling 1,548,078 square feet with underground parking located at 4077 Fifth Avenue. The 21.07 acre site is in the CC38, CC39, OC11, and OR11 zones. Uptown Community Plan CD3. Presenters will provide updates about the construction plans and permitting process. And our presenters this evening are Robin Madaffer, Monica Montano, and Jeff Benson. Welcome. Thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Please. <clears throat> okay. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. We see your screen. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for having us here tonight. My name is Monica Montano, and we are here to present an update of the Scripps Mercy Hospital San Diego Campus Master Plan. We have presented to you before, and in an effort to keep you informed of the advancements of the project, we plan to continue periodical updates throughout the review process. I'd like to introduce part of our team with me here tonight. We have Tim Jacoby, who's our Scripps Health Corporate Vice President of Construction and Facilities. Jeff Benson, who's our Scripps Health Director of Corporate Construction. Robin Madaffer from San Diego Land Lawyers. Sorry, I'm trying to go to my next. Sorry, I'm trying to go to my next um, screen here. There we go. So just a little bit of background. As you may all know, as the law stands now, we are required to retrofit this facility to meet seismic standards by 2030. The current Scripps Mercy Hospital San Diego campus was built in 1925. Much has changed in healthcare and our now dated hospital is in need of modernization. It has become even more apparent through the current health crisis that we need to build this hospital sooner rather than later. This has been a two year internal planning process. We submitted our application back in February, 2020. As you can see on this aerial view of our campus, this project site encompasses approximately 21 acres. It does not require or propose a community plan amendment as it is in compliance with the land use designation of the Uptown Community Plan. The community plan land use designation for the subject site is institutional and the site is located within the medical complex neighborhood of the Uptown Community Plan. This slide shows those areas which would be demoed during the redevelopment of the project. I would also like to point out the cancer center outlined on the left, which is down over here, 
which is currently under construction, and the area labeled parking lot off of 6th Avenue, which is this area here, which is beginning construction, are not part of the CUP. This slide indicates the new areas that will be developed. The project is consistent with the urban design element of the Uptown Community Plan. The partial redevelopment of the site contributes to development diversity within Uptown, as well as within the Mercy Medical Complex. We anticipate breaking ground on MOB 1 in 2022, followed by Tower 1 and the Entry Pavilion in 2024. This slide shows an axiom view of the redeveloped campus and park completion. The project preserves and expands upon the distribution of land use that provides for a range of goods and services that meet the needs of the community by expanding upon the existing medical care and providing modernized facilities. It is also compatible with the established neighborhood surrounding the site and provides adequate transitions between the new and existing development. Again, we will continue to keep you informed as we proceed through the project and share milestones. We are happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, let us go, are there any public members that have any questions on this presentation and update? Yes, I do. My name is Jeff Robles. Please go uh, ahead. Could you show me where the uh, parks will be located in that uh, complex. Monica, do you want to put the share screen back up? Yes, I am going there. And um, let me see, just one second. Okay, let me know. I'm sorry, it takes like a little delay once I do the share screen to be able to move back through the slides for some once, reason. But once you do, Monica, Jeff, I'd be happy to take that question. That'd be great. This is Robin. Thanks, Robin. <laughs> okay, okay, Robin, is this the, the slide you want? No, go to, the, go to the first one, go to the aerial. Okay. There we go. So first of all, this is all private property. There are no public uh, parks or facilities that will be located on this property. Um, we will be building a building where the existing fountain plaza is, which is, Monica, maybe you can show where that is. And we are reorienting the entryway into the newly constructed hospital because of course the old hospital, the existing hospital has to stay operational until the new hospital is completed. So what we've planned and what we're not necessarily ready to show you right now um, because it's still in design and development and, and, and we're still trying to figure it out is that we've planned a series of of other open areas that are intended to be used for employees, doctors, patients, visitors of, of the campus. Uh, there will be no areas that are invited that, that we will be inviting the public to come in um, unless they're using the facilities at, at the campus. Um, and that has to do with safety and security issues, obviously. Um, so I appreciate the question, Jeff, and, and what we would um, uh, hope to do is next time we give an update is, is to have more details about where those open areas will be as amenities for the campus. Um, I also want to just add one other thing, and this is, uh, I, I think, Br'er, you're the, the chair of the Design Assistance Subcommittee. We'd really like to come to your group next before we come back to Uptown Planners as a whole. So we can kind of go into some fine grain uh, detail and on, on these sorts of things so that, that we can um, you know, hash out, if you will, or, or, or talk about some of the, the issues and, 
and ideas that, that you might have. But keep in mind for this whole group, we're, we're still in a planning stage. We're waiting on our second round of comments from the city. Um, and it's, it's, it's delayed a little bit, <laughs> um, about four weeks right now. Uh, and, and so <clears throat> we're waiting for those comments to come back, but we've been in close conversation with Michael and, and with other folks at the city to try and come to some sort of uh, terms on the planning process so that when we do come back to you and, and of course design assistance, that, that we have things that we can talk about and, and, um, and resolve if, if, if necessary. Thank you, Robin. That would, that would be wonderful. Thank you. And just to add, Brer, um, we have submitted a request to you. So you, you will, you'll have that in your email. We sent that out already. Thank you very much. Uh, any other public comments? On yes, this? I'd like to add to that. This is a community plan amendment. And you also have in most developers that own where development is being done on private property, the community plan calls for parks. If I'm correct, I don't believe there are any parks in that medical area. And the density is being increased in that area significantly, yet there are no parks. Thank you for the comment, Jeff. We'll, we'll come back to answering that shortly. Uh, any other public comments on this uh, presentation? Hands. No, okay. Um, all right, and I guess, can you please uh, address Jeff's last comment before I go to the board? It's this. It's it's the same response that the the existing Fountain Plaza area, um, which is off of Fourth and Lewis, that is not a public park. It's it's private property, and the intention, uh, I believe, uh, originally was it's it's kind of a. Um, a reflecting area for uh, patients, visitors, staff, and, and doctors of the campus. That's always what it was intended to be. Um, and when the fountain was operational, I, I, I'll remind you back, I don't know how many years ago, but when we were in the midst of a drought and Scripps, you know, took, took the, made the decision as a um, service to the community. For and since that time, it appears that people have been using that fountain area, um, you know, for bench seating and, and, and whatnot. But when the fountain's on, that's not possible. It's kind of like an amphitheater. Most of you are, I'm, I'm sure, familiar with it. Um, so it's not a public area. It's not a, um, it's, it's, it's private property. And <clears throat> the intention is to disperse those reflection areas throughout the campus, um, provide benches, provide places where people who are visiting or, or using the facility um, can go for some respite. Uh, that, that is, is the intention. And um, I, I, as, as far as I know, there's no requirement to provide for park acreage for an institutional use. That comes hand in hand with residential development. Robin, thank you for that. I think I think just take the comments um, as just uh, constructive criticism from the community, um, whereby implementing a design that connects the community similar to how it's set up right now. We're not necessarily. I don't think people are saying put a huge public park on your private land, but just keep that in mind. I think these are going to be productive uh, comments from the public and our board will make comments as well. Um, and then when you come to design review board, you know, we can we can go through more details on these items. Um, let's switch to the board. Are there any board members that would like to make some comments on this presentation? Uh, I see Tom's face. Tom, do you have any comments? No? Uh, uh, yes, I do. Uh, yes, uh, is there any, any plan to improve uh, transportation, getting people off 163 into the hospital and back out? Yeah, great question, Tom. I appreciate that. Um, we have prepared a traffic analysis and we were hoping by this meeting that we would have city comments back on that. Um, again, the review is behind and we hope to have those very soon. 
And I think at the next meeting and certainly at design review, um, we'll have an opportunity to, to share more about that. But this is more of a high level review and our intention is to um, create better access in and out of, of the campus. Great, thank you. Uh, Gail, do you have any comments? I see you on my screen. No, yes, maybe, no, okay. Uh, Roy, would you like to make any comments? Sure, I'll make a quick comment. It, it's interesting in that when we were studying parkland and studying open space that this particular spot was highlighted in a lot of the city's reports as to how nice things are actually in uptown. And unfortunately we're losing this nice thing. So I'm not saying that we have to impose this nice thing on this hospital, but I think it's a sign as we go forward with our community plan update, the importance of getting these kinds of um, amenities built into some private property as it, as it develops upward. And if there's anything the hospital can do to give back a little bit of this kind of park land, I think it would be helpful. Thanks. Thank you for that comment. Um, Clint, do you have any comments? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, I, I don't disagree with wanting to have more parks in the community, but I'd also remind folks too that the UCSD master plan includes four mm -hmm. new acres of parkland in the center of the campus, which is just down the street. So. While we may be losing an unofficial parklet, um, we're gaining four acres, you know, a few blocks away. That's a good example. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, Dennis, would you like to make a comment? I, know, I, I had a question. I'm not familiar with residential, co commercial. Are there any diff fees that are being generated by this? And uh, comment on the space that's being lost, whether it's private or public, it was being enjoyed by the public. And it's just one more indication of the general consensus that every little bit of space that we lose as density is built uh, is going to be of concern. But diff fees, any, anything being generated by this? There will be diff fees, uh, and we have no idea yet how much those are. That's It's premature for us to get into that calculation. All right, uh, Mr. Smith, would you like to make any comments on this project? Yeah, I'd like to state uh, how much I appreciate the enormous investment in rebuilding the entire area uh, must be. And I have to ask out of curiosity, how much is the entire project going to cost uh, just in a ballpark figure? Tim, can I call on you to uh, respond to that? Um, sure. It's um, the entire master plan project with uh, the associated parking and MOBs and hospital is north of a billion dollars. Yeah, that's, that's quite an investment in mm -hmm. our community. Uh, as to the fact that there are, there's no green space there, I, I, I would give up green space in order to have a first class medical facility to take care of our community and not to mention myself as I'm getting older. Um, this, is a, this is a big city. This is a big hospital. I'm sure they're smart enough to find a way to put some kind of amenities into it. Um, it's not the place where I would ask them to trade off the functionality of their campus for somebody's ability to, to, to walk through a small green space. I, Appreciate the value of the green space, but I just think the hospital is is a um, and the commitment they made financially is uh, more important than a marginal improvement in our green space. That's my comment. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Brandon, would you like to make any comments? Yeah. Also, you know, I want to say thank you for you know the investment that you'd be making in our community. Um, we recognize this is a Herculean effort here. Um, you know, just kind of looking at the overall plan, um, I think there's, you know, there's this kind of really interesting mid-century modern um, tower at the end of Fifth there um, that's always been kind of iconic in my mind. Um, it looks like that will be coming down um, in these plans, I'm, I'm just curious about that. 
Um, and also, um, that could be an opportunity, I think, uh, you know, as you come up fifth, it, it always felt to me like that was, that could always be some kind of gateway into the medical complex or community up there. Um, you know, maybe that could be a place where you put some kind of art, you know, sculpture or something iconic, um, you know, in lieu of, of that building kind of being a bookend um, to Uptown and the Fifth Avenue corridor. Um, that's, I guess that's my comment for the moment. Thanks, Michael. Uh, let's see. Breer, would you like to make any comments? Uh, I, I'll, I'll reserve my comments and I'll just say that um, I'll make sure to uh, arrange for notices to be sent out for uh, design review when we schedule something so interested people can uh, come and hear the presentation. Great, that's awesome. Uh, Mr. Daniel, would you like to make any comments? <clears throat> no. Uh, Stephen? No. Matt? No. All right. Stu, would you like to make a comment? Uh, thank you for the presentation. My main concern is the vehicle, uh, the emergency vehicle access, whether coming from downtown or the freeways. So hopefully you get a favorable traffic analysis and uh, good luck. Thanks. Wonderful. All right. I appreciate everybody's comments and I appreciate this presentation. Uh, we look forward to having you back at our design review subcommittee um, and uh, good luck with this huge endeavor. This is a big project. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And we're going to be seeing you soon. Wonderful. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so Eli, I have one quick question for um, I, just because we lost two members of our uh, Hillcrest uh, subcommittee. Um, so I just didn't know from Michael if, uh, you know, if we should be looking at, add, I think we can add one. We still have 14 members left on our board. I think we're at six now that would put us back at seven. So I think if we're still under eight, we're okay. But um, or if we're fine with moving forward with six, then that you know that's where we're at right now. But I just want to kind of put that out there for the board. We can discuss it in greater detail at our next meeting. But um, I just want us to be aware that both Zach and Amy were both on uh, that subcommittee. Okay. Uh and if, if someone is interested in being on that sub subcommittee and wasn't on the subcommittee, feel free to shoot me an email directly and uh, that is another option. All Thanks. right. Thanks for bringing that up. All right, ladies and gentlemen, appreciate everybody's time. Move to adjourn. Thank you. Can I get a second? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Perfect. Appreciate everybody. Get your vaccinations and we'll see you next month. Thank you all for attending. Gail, um, I will get you the recording uh, once it's completed and we can post it up on the website. So great. Have a good night. <laughs>